It's a Bumblecast Mini, sponsored by Sonic PAJ. Let's go for it. If I recall correctly, Ian, you said you got your job writing Sonic for Archie pretty soon after you graduated from university. I wanted to ask, did you take any types of creative writing classes? If so, which ones, and do you think they helped you in the grand scheme of things? I took a number of English courses, had a bit of a Shakespeare focus, um, did a short fiction writing course, and a smattering of others, uh, including a linguistics, because, you know, kind of getting under the hood of what is English is fascinating. Of the stuff I studied, I felt like the Shakespeare, the Shakespearean courses helped me more in understanding why the Bard's works have endured for as long as they have. What is it that is so compelling about them and what is so universal in their storytelling and characters? Um, the short fiction writing class was <laughs> more of a lesson in gauging your audience and, uh, how popularity influences your success. Uh, I submitted one entry for the course and we all discussed it as a round table event and the professor hated it just did not like the structure, didn't like the conceit, didn't like the execution, but everyone else in the class loved it. Like, no, this is, this is good. And he's like, well, no, this part is bad. And like, well, no, it works because of this way. And I just sat there and let the discussion fly until finally the professor just kind of said, well, whatever. And I passed. And he's like, okay. So it's not really a matter of actual expertise or taste. It's appealing to the right audience, I guess. <laughs> Not sure if that's the lesson I was supposed to take away from it, but there you go. <laughs> oh, man. Someone in this instance is a hack fraud. I don't know which one. Well, he was also a raging misogynist, so I only oh. take his critiques with a certain degree of credulity. Okay, I think we found him. I think we found who the hack fraud was in this moment. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Woo. Something I struggle with is writing humorous dialogue. When I have table reads of my scripts, my audience slash fellow actors tend to laugh at these shockingly absurd situations, quirky character mannerisms, and some of my and my friends' voice acting. But when it comes to quote-unquote wit, I'm constantly second-guessing myself. I'm not sure how long I can sustain the aforementioned forms of humor. How can I write funny slash witty dialogue? Are they even the same thing? Humor is subjective. And it is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you manage to land a joke character or gimmick, and then it's like, okay, how, did, how do I make lightning strike twice? What did I do? Is it really that funny? I don't know. Humor might be the most difficult thing to get right. And oh, even yeah. then, it's obviously very subjective. So, What is the old saying? Comedy is hard. Dying is easy. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> Something uh, like that. Yeah. In the end, the rule of thumb that I try to follow is I write what makes me laugh. And when I come back to it after a bit, if it still makes me laugh, I think it's okay. Uh, it might get flagged by, you know, the editor or the licensor or, you know, somebody else. And you have to rethink the joke because it may be funny to you. And it doesn't really sell to the rest of the audience. That's where the group editing process kind of helps you out. But Look at what you enjoy in terms of media, you know, when it comes to turns of phrase or comedy or what have you, and try to emulate that. Recreate what entertains you, and hopefully that will find your audience, or your audience will find you. Why not both? Maybe. I would say don't get hung up on trying to be witty, because the harder you try to be witty, the more easily it is to tell that it's an effort. If you can't find a clever way of phrasing it, don't. You're trying to put a flourish on there that isn't really necessary, maybe. And if you think of it later, cool, go back and revise. But don't stress over the presentation. Stress over the... Pr <laughs> don't Try not to stress over it. What am I talking about? We're writers. Of course you're going to stress over it. That's silly. <laughs> uh, focus more on conveying the information you need to and setting the tone and being true to your characters and the rest should hopefully kind of fall into place. And if not, there's always revision. 
Indeed. You know, Aaliyah's in the chat being all snarky back there. She says, humor's easy. Yeah. Maybe for her. I don't know. She seems pretty adept at humor. Like, startlingly so. I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a weird thing. Maybe it's just something she has that we don't. She has the, the magic. I don't know. So, yeah, as mentioned, I write scripts, scripts mostly for personal projects. Now these scripts are modeled after animation scripts at about 29 to 40 pages in length. However, animation is not within the budget right now, but I am able to commission friends and strangers to draw the story in comic form. The challenge now is to convert a script meant for animation into the comic format. I notice on the Bumblecast site and various special Sonic comics that a comic script looks way different than an animation script. How hard is it to reformat an animation script to comic form? Do I even need to? Adam Bryce Thomas at Sonic Revolution 2022 said it would be easy, but it looks like a lot of work. Uh, maybe it'd be easy for Adam, but you see what he can do, so... <laughs> uh, to me, the biggest problem, and this is something I still struggle with, is comics are a static medium the motion and the moment to moment action that you envision has to be rendered in a finite amount of space in panels that do not move. The day we are able to somehow print animated GIFs will be a game changer, but that ain't going to happen overnight. So, you know, what would be one minute of animation could be, two or three pages of comic stuff, depending on how you lay it out. You can kind of think of comics as the storyboards in animation, sort of, kind of. So to me, it's very different mentalities and very different disciplines. There's a shared foundation to be sure, but what you can accomplish and how much time and space you have, I think are wildly different. And that impacts the scope of your project, where you focus your energies and what takes priority, both in terms of action and in narrative. So I don't have an easy answer for you, but likely if you're going to convert something that's meant for animation to comic format, unless you are looking at decompressed money is no option, graphic novel, <laughs> you're probably going to have to take a weed whacker to it and really parse it down. Yeah, that would make sense. You got a bit more, you got to be a bit more selective about your uh, scenes in that case. I've written eight episodes of these scripts, but given their length and the time it takes to create a comic, I noticed that the web comics have much shorter chapters than what an episode would be, though reading speed probably has an effect on that. The question is, how do I define an approximately 30-minute episode into chapters without it feeling too disjointed? Uh, depends on the format of your webcomic. Yeah. Like, if you're doing a traditional four to eight panel comic page, that's going to be wildly different than, like, Webtoon, where you've got 30 to 50 individual panels in a vertical scrolling format. Yeah. The way that you tell the story on a 8 by 11 page is going to flow completely differently than your webtoon vertical scroll. Yeah. Or the, or even like th three panel gag strips, you know, obviously yeah, so right things back. get a little different. It's, there's so many different ways to tell stories in comic form. So, and this goes back to the earlier point, you know, comics and animation are different disciplines. They're different mediums for telling stories and they have their different strengths and weaknesses. And, understanding how to use either is tricky and converting one to the other is not something you can just do slapdash. Um, a 30 minute episode, you know, is it action oriented? Is it more dialogue driven? Because roughly speaking about a minute's worth of dialogue is going to translate to about a page worth of script. So if it's a very talky, you know, script, then you're looking at your 30 minutes. But if it's an action beat, you know, a two paragraph description of your action beats could turn into five, 10 minutes of action on screen, which could translate into God knows how many pages, depending on how intricate you want that action sequence to be. And you don't want that to run too long because as 
much as eye candy is great to follow, especially in the, you know, highly implied action in the manga format, just looking at action panels back to back can be kind of tedious because you're not engaging with it as much as you would on the written page or with written dialogue. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you don't want to have too much written dialogue interspersed with your action scenes because somebody's then saying a soliloquy as they fly through the air, throwing a kick that it's silly. (laughs) So it's without seeing the actual material or knowing the exact format that you're approaching. It's really hard to say how to convert one to the other. All right. One problem or worry I have run into in writing my series is that sometimes I think my main protagonist might not be compelling or defined enough. All the friends, rivals, and enemies seem to have very distinct personalities, but my central main character in one episode acts cool and confident, and in another he's stressing out and gets, dare I say, angsty. I'm not even a fan of angst. I want him to be likable and inspiring. How can I make my my protagonist more consistently likable but believable without making him an obnoxious extreme of either? Maybe you need to step back and look at the character, your central character themselves. And I get this because, you know, you know, their story arc, you know, them the most intimately. So they become kind of familiar and you don't feel like you think as deeply on them. And then there's all the fun offshoots, the foils and the reflections of that main character who may not necessarily be as deep. It's like, Ooh, that's the fun new toy. I want to go explore their story. I want to see the cool action beat with them. Yeah. 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 Main protagonist. They're the vehicle that'll get there. We'll get back to you, son. Let me go see the angsty rival. (laughs) Like step back and there's a number of uh, cheat sheets circulating out there on building a character's personality, you know, stuff that covers the mundane things. What is their favorite food? What is their favorite color? What is, do they like it when it rains or do they prefer sunshine? Those kinds of things that help you inform who this character is and look at who they are at the beginning of your story and where you are, where you want them to end up at the end and see the trajectory that they have to follow to get there and ask yourself, what are the influences that affect that journey? And if you want them to reach a point at the end where they have learned a lesson or they have grown in a certain way or they have conquered an inner demon, then they have to start with that detriment at the beginning. And that may not necessarily be an immediately likable trait, but that's okay. Your character is growing and they are going to change. And that's the story. And the folks who judge them at the very beginning go, oh, I don't like them because of X, Y, or Z. Well, they're not going to stick with your story anyway, or they're not going to understand it. Don't worry about them. Worry about telling your story the best way that you can. And don't, I guess the crux of it is don't worry about making them immediately likable and relatable in every possible way, because nobody is like that. Your character can be flawed. Your character can have shortcomings and that journey is acknowledging them and overcoming them. Or maybe not. Maybe that's the tragedy of your story is your character doesn't learn and continues to repeat the same mistakes. I don't know. All depends on the project, but you know, really take a step back, look at your character, look at who they are, why they are the way they are. And when they are reacting to the various stimuli of your story, really look and see if that's an authentic reaction or if you want the moment to happen. Like maybe you think this is a big cathartic moment. You want that turnaround for a character, but is it earned? Is Would your character actually make that leap? And if the answer is no, probably not, then you're going to have to kill your darling. I hate that phrase. I hate that rule. I hate having to do it. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you also got to keep in mind that, you know, having characters that act differently doesn't mean it's out of character for them. You know, they have characters can have emotions. It can be a well-rounded person by reacting differently to different things or going through 
different things. Like you say, you have an episode one acts cool and confident, and then in another, they're stressing out and getting angsty. And it's like, well, that's just part of being human. Sometimes you feel cool and confident, and other times you're stressed out and not feeling good. So you know, right? Are they cool and confident in this moment because they're in their element? They feel confident and secure, and thus they can act that way when they have their angsty moment. Is that because that comfort has been ripped away? That they are out of their element and they don't know how to react and that bothers them it it all depends on the moment right yeah exactly i had this crazy idea of printing out 100 copies of the first issue and giving them away for free at a convention or my local comic store to get people on an email list any idea how much that would cost uh a lot if you <laughs> i will yeah, say if you if you're going to do pure black and white cheap card stock and like print it out your local staples or whatever and do the assembly yourself. Uh, if you're going to do like a smaller size, like what, what is the standard under eight by 11, six by nine, I think. Something like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, 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 it's a lot either way. It, it'll right If you're really stingy, you can come out in a few hundred dollars. Um, if you go beyond that, like full standard, sizing having somebody else do the assembly color glossy card stock oh lord uh you're going to be reaching into the thousands pretty quick so uh it's a bold move to be sure and you know free stuff is free that that goes pretty easily but make sure that you're in a position where you can throw that money down a hole Assume that you will, that for, if you, if you print out a hundred copies of your free book, assume a 1% retention of readership. Yeah, pretty much. Like it's, there is so much media out there demanding people's attention that just getting any kind of traction is exceedingly difficult. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about getting uh getting readers i mean it's a it's a bold way for sure but maybe not the best so i don't i wouldn't personally recommend that method but mm. i mean also if the intention is to get them on an email a newsletter then you know step one is getting their attention step two is having the material to continually engage with them uh if you just have the newsletter you know, chain there, but you don't have consistent updates coming out with it, then you've defeated the purpose of your project. Now, disclaimer, I am extremely risk averse with this sort of thing. I like to have everything pre-made, pre-planned, pre-scheduled, ready to go so that there is like zero room for question or hiccups or anything i like to have things every t crossed every die odd <laughs> every i dotted uh and that is not necessarily the most practical way to do it and i may have missed out on opportunities because i am very very cautious so take my advice with a grain of salt take everything i say with a grain of salt <laughs> in some cases maybe even an entire salt shaker maybe Enough about me, back to you, Sensei Flynn. During the Game Apologist review of the Tangle and Whisper miniseries, he points out that he can hear Ian in the titular character's heart-to-heart -heart conversation. I've come to notice, looking back on various Sonic and Mega Man books, that the heart-to-heart -heart in is indeed an Ian Flynn-ism. It's even very prevalent in a very popular recent non-comic outing. Why? Where does this trope come from? Um... I don't know. Like, it's not a conscious decision on my part, but thinking back, it's like, yeah, I guess I do do that. Hmm. <laughs> it's not like, and the thing is, it's not a very natural interaction. You don't really get two people stopping in the middle of their emotional climax to calmly hash things out or speak unadulterated truths to reach an understanding. But Darn it, it's satisfying when you read it on the page. Yeah. And I kind of console myself with the notion of this is fantasy anyway. You know, it doesn't have to be completely true to life. 
you're reading this for entertainment, not for documentary purposes. So, yeah, uh, I can't think of a particular instance that inspires that trope. Uh, but I guess it is one of my standbys and <laughs> you'll probably see it again in the future. I, I've talked to you so much now at this point that I can smell the stench of anything you've had your hands in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Why you gotta have sticky hands, dude? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, you just have a very distinct style that I've come to recognize. <laughs> so, which is, uh, it, it's kind of fun, actually, to be like, oh, yeah, this sounds like Ian. Like, I I can hear. I can hear Ian. I I feel like since we do the Bumblecast so often now, there's probably a lot of people who read what you've written and are like, yeah, okay. They they might even read it in your voice, which is weird. Oh, please don't. No, 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 no. no. Weird. Sitting <laughs> there reading an entire Sonic comic and nothing but your voice for each character. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, that is pretty funny. It's pretty funny to think about. <laughs> Are you familiar with the small, short, and very accessible book, How to Steal Like an Artist, by Austin Kleon? The thesis of this book is basically nothing is original. Everything that seems like it is is really a combination of many stolen things, and that an artist must not only look to their inspiration, but the inspirations of their inspirations, and so on and so on. As your works are an inspiration to me, what are your inspirations? And if possible, do you know your inspirations' inspirations? I've not read it, but that is a uh, true enough thesis. And the other takeaway I have for it is don't get hung up on uh, hitting the same beats or tropes as the things you enjoy. I, at the same time, you know, don't put out a purple mongoose named speedy who fights a fat guy that operates machines you know try to if you're going to retell something that you enjoy at least put a fresh coat of paint on it you know well, try to have some originality in there well turning to turning in purple that's a fresh coat of paint uh yeah, it needs a little more than that um my inspiration's truth be told, largely come from you know, the cartoons of the 80s and 90s. I grew up on those toy commercials, and they greatly influenced my love for fantasy and episodic story content and, you know, bright, colorful, archetypal characters that you can kind of understand at a glance and going on big adventures. But the mundane is... Yeah kind of aversive to me. Um, and then author wise, the biggest two inc influences for me off the top of my head are like Stephen King and Kurt Vonnegut, both of whom to one degree or another kind of approach reality and say, you know what? No, I'm going to do it my way. And you just, you're along for the ride. Uh, the gunslinger series, the dark tower series specifically, I know King's gone back and said that the original treatment of the gunslinger was too interpretive, that it needed to be more structured. And I understand that, but that was the version I read and I bought wholesale into that extremely open ended form of narrative that you would drop terms and thoughts just without context and leave the reader to wonder what the hell you're talking about. Cause to me, that was fun. That gave me a sense of there was a much larger world that we hadn't explored and you were only seeing a piece of it. And that just sparked the imagination. It's like, Ooh, what does that mean? What, what greater context is there to it? And there probably wasn't any, but it's there. And that's fertile soil and that gets you thinking and that gets you engaged. And where am I going with any of that? Uh, the, <laughs> Inspirations for the inspirations that I'm not as familiar with. Um, and I honestly tend to shy away from it a little bit just because once I learn everything behind the curtain, when I really look under the hood 
and get into something, it removes the mysticism for me. I already have a hard enough time reading comics now because I don't see the comic anymore. I, I see the matrix code. I see the editorial influence. I see the greater structural thinking. I see the pacing and writer intent in there. And I just can't enjoy it as a medium anymore. So I kind of don't want to know what the author's intent was. Let me just consume the media and enjoy it as it is. Cause then you bring the real world into it and it sucks. It drags all the joy out of it. <laughs> it's like, oh, the author was really using this as an analog for something horribly racist. No, no, no. I want to like it still. <laughs> no. Oh, wait, this is incredibly influential and so cool. And I love the visuals behind it. And oh, no, this guy is a raging misogynist. Oh. 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 This story is full of great life lessons and universal truths. And the author is actually a reactionary who hates all these aspects. The, why did they write it that way? Uh, don't think about it too hard. I guess that's the, uh, the moral of the story. It's a bad moral. You need to think more. You need to be I critical know. of the media you consume. You need to be aware of that around you. But I mean, you it's are exhausting. Right. You are right, but yeah, it is it is very exhausting. And Ugh. another incredibly egotistical level of it is it makes me hyper aware of myself and my public presentation because I am terrified of the thought of somebody enjoying something I've done, learning more about me, and then going, oh, ew, I can't read this anymore. That... It is my ever waking nightmare. I want to be the kind of person that people are like, oh, what a lovely individual. I want to be inspired by him. He is a good man and he contributes to the greater whole of humanity. I've got some bad news. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I've got some bad news. It's already happened. <laughs> and listen, it's not anything you did, honestly. <laughs> You didn't actually really do anything. I mean, people disagreeing with your political views or your things you've put out there. It's like un inevitably that's going to happen, unfortunately. I know. You can't I appeal know. to everybody and there's people who are going to be mad that you said something about something and they don't like that something. And yeah, it's it will always happen, unfortunately. I know the feeling, though. I understand the desire to be likable. <laughs> but at the same time, it's not going to be... It's not realistic, man. <laughs> You're never going to be able to please everyone. I know, so, but as we've established, I'm not really a big fan of realism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Realism's kind of boring and kind of sucks. If I wanted realism, I'd go outside and, well, we know what's out there and... It's gross. I don't want to go out there. Somebody put a big star up there and it's all bright and hot. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. Ian, in terms of your writing, are you an architect? Plan everything out before your pen hits the paper or fingers hit the keys? Or a pruner? Write the script and trim what doesn't work as you look back. Oh, architect to be sure. Like, have the 20 page series Bible out before you even get to issue one. <laughs> And, you know, exhaust yourself and all the pre-planning to the point where the beginning material that is necessary, the foundational work of your story is boring because you already know where it all goes. Um, mm -hmm. I hate revision. I hate revision because you go through it and you're clever and it works and you put it together just as you intended. And it's fine. It's good. You don't need to go back. Why look at it again? You did it right the first time. Oh, wait. No, you didn't. You never did. It always needs to be scrapped. You always have to do heavy revision on the first draft. You are not perfect. It's never going to be right the first time. You will learn this eventually, hopefully, before you hit 60. I don't know. You've been struggling with this since kindergarten. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've gone back and forth myself on the few times I've written anything. Like sometimes I'll 
pre pre plan and other times I'll just write something and then go back later or not go back later and just ignore it and be like, oh, cringe thinking about it and not want to touch it again. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't really have a specific one in my, my head yet for one of those, but I don't know, maybe someday. Would 2006 Ian be a fan of 2022 Ian's work? I don't know. If knowing not, I guess maybe not knowing it's you. Hmm. Would you know? Would you? Hmm. This is pondered silence on my end. I figured. Just thinking back on how I approached things way back when, in the long, long ago. 2006 Ian might find current Ian's methods too quick paced, too sloppy. You've lost that meticulous edge. You could do so much more. There could be so much more nuance to which older, grayer, fatter Ian says, you don't need to fine tune every single thing. You know, the multitude of nuances that you have precision aligned is going to go unnoticed by 99% of the audience. And that's just going to frustrate you. And it doesn't bear fruit in the long run. The long con is a fun thing to do. You can't hinge and shouldn't hinge everything on it. Focus on what you have in front of you and do a good job now with an eye on the horizon to be sure. But do what you can with what you have. Don't worry about the long term. The long term will come. Tomorrow will happen, whether you like it or not. But today is just as important. 2006, Ian would be appalled that you've given so many concessions to, like, what is and is not canon or, you know, not (laughs) fitting, not fitting, not making sure every little thing fits together like a big jigsaw, you know, kind of like, you've kind of just (laughs) been like, just let it go. Just don't worry about it. (laughs) Some of the discussions I've had with the lore group is like, I have betrayed everything that younger me stood for. (laughs) I have become the man. Oh. You traitor. And it's uh, like, yeah, but perspective kind of changes things. And yeah, yeah. You understand where these rules are coming from and what the alternative is. Mm hmm. Yep. You were the chosen one. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to find some like old Google image of me, put it on flambéed anakin i hate you <laughs> it's you versus you <laughs> and then they put the more haggard me on obi-wan hello there <laughs> i have the high ground <laughs> don't want kyle to be left out on the off chance you are into mashups have you ever checked out the site rave.dj It's an AI-based music mashup site that allows users to fuse nearly any two songs from YouTube and or Spotify. So far, most of the results have been iffy, but my prize prize bangers so far have been Uh, RE Boot, One OK Rock, Cross Live and Learn, Run With Us, Cross She Worked Hard for Her Money, and (laughs) Com Susur Todd, Cross Dear Father. Huh, interesting. I've actually not heard of this site before at all, but uh, I will have to check it out. Um, I, oh, go ahead. Especially that run with us. She works hard for her money. I can almost hear that in my head. <laughs> yeah, I I do enjoy, I mean, mashups. I like remixes, mashups, kind of combining things, doing things different. But yeah, that, that sounds like right up my alley. So I'd have to check it out. It might be, uh, might be a fun thing to, to uh, work with. And our last question Ian and Kyle, this is more or less a Sonic podcast, but did you know that the Hedgehog and the Fox have been paired long before Maurice and Miles ever met? The Greek poet Archilochus said, the Fox knows many things, but the Hedgehog knows one big thing. In other words, Foxes are detail-oriented people and Hedgehogs are big picture people. Ian, Kyle, what are you, a Hedgehog or a Fox? 
Aesop had a hedgehog slash fox fable about how it's better to bear a smaller evil than unleash a greater greater one, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Which almost sounds like the basis of an actual Sonic plot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm a hedge fox. Like, I get distracted by the bigger picture and then also very much buried in the weeds of all the little particulars getting to that big picture and then wildly oscillating between the two until I hit burnout. I have no idea <laughs> about what, what I fit in, which am I like, I guess like you, I could go kind of either way or a combination of both. I don't know. What, what do you, what do you think Ian, as an outside from an outside perspective? What would you? I would peg me as. I would tend to say more of a big picture guy. I think attentive to the minutia that needs to get there, sure. But I feel like you had a clearer vision for what the Bumblecast would be when we first started than I did. Which is uh, funny because I was still unsure of even what we were going to be exactly doing. <laughs> but hey, we made it work. And, you know, the way you've run KNGI this entire time, uh -huh. like, I feel like that's been a vision that you've stayed true to for, God, how many years now? Uh, 20, almost. Yeah. See, that, that's about as big a picture as you can get. <laughs> well, I mean, I wanted a radio station. I wanted to and be, be on the radio. KNGI.org, go listen. That's what I did. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I guess I I tend to see how the details work up to the bigger picture. That's maybe one way to put it. So I know I know from you looking at you, Ian, you're you're definitely also like a you're both. You definitely have elements of both. But uh, I think you keep the big picture in mind, though. So maybe that's why we both get along because we're very similar on this. I think. So we still manage to, we keep the big picture in mind, but we also make sure to cover the details. Something like that. And that's it. Yep. Thank you to Sonic PAJ for sponsoring this Bumblecast Mini. If you want one of your own, head over to patreon.com slash bumblecast, ko-fi.com slash bumblecast, or become a YouTube member. See you in the next one.